would like to call this meeting uh, to order of the Town of Sheffield uh, Select Board on uh, Monday, July 5th, uh, 2022. I want to let you know that the meeting is recorded, being recorded by CTSB, uh, and therefore it is available on their um, website for streaming, uh, as well as uh, on the television channel. Um, if you want to record the meeting, please just let the chair know. Um, the first thing that we would like to do is I have a moment of silence for uh, Jim Collingwood. And Nadine, may I ask you to uh, do sure. this for us? On behalf of the Board of Selectmen, we'd like to express our condolences to the Collingwood family for the loss of Jim Jr. Jim was a longtime member of our planning board, serving many years as its chairman. Um, Jim also was a contracted snowplower for us for many years. As a matter of fact, I have a love note that he left me in the snow one morning. Wu was here. Uh, that still makes me smile. Um, Jim is a longtime Kiwanian in Sheffield and has served our town in more ways than I can possibly count. Um, I said to somebody today, he was a friend to every one of us. All anyone ever had to do was ask, and he was there for us. So with that, we can have that moment of silence. Thank you, Nadine. Our first order of business tonight is approval of uh, meeting minutes but we are going to um, pass over that and go to our second uh, item, which is an update from the Regional School District Planning Board. Um, we have um, three members from the board uh, today. Lucy, why don't I ask you to uh, step to the podium and then I'm gonna let you do the introductions so that you can get the positioning and titles perfect, okay? Thank you for being with us, all of you. Well, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for having us here tonight. I need to begin by apologizing because my hearing is terrible, especially in this, in this room. And so if I don't hear you, uh, I may have to ask you to repeat. So I apologize in advance. Um, when we last met with you, I'm Lucy Crasher, I'm chair of the Regional School District Planning Board. Um, we were last before the Sheffield Select Board in February of 2021, and that was by telephone. So we're really happy to be here in person tonight. It's a pleasure to see everyone in person. And we really do want to thank you for the opportunity to give you this update on our work and our plan moving forward. We're gonna spare you a PowerPoint tonight. Um, I did bring with us some packets of uh, summaries of the work we've been doing. Um, they are summaries of materials that are on our website, which is 8towns.org. Uh, the website is great. Uh, it has a lot of material, but I find sometimes it's helpful to have some old-fashioned paper in front of me. Um, and so you have that option as well. Most of you here tonight are familiar with our work, but for those who are not, and for those who are listening uh, at home, uh, I want to give a bit of history. So the Eight Town Regional School District Planning Board was formed in March of 2020. So we've been at this for a little bit over two years. The composition is determined by statute, three members from each town who are appointed by the moderator of each town, with one of those three being a school committee representative. Bonnie Silvers is the Sheffield School Committee representative on our board. Our two other members are Nadine Palmer and Colin Smith. And all three of your representatives have been very strong contributors to this process, and we are very fortunate to have all three on our board. Our statutory mandate is to determine the educational and financial advisability of regionalization, or in this case, further regionalization by combining the two existing regional school districts. We are essentially a study group 
Um, and if we determine that regionalization is advisable, our charge is to report our recommendation and a proposed regional school district agreement to the select boards who are then charged with putting the question to the residents of the town. So the question is ultimately decided by the residents of the eight member towns. During the first phase of our work, we engaged the Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools, which is also known as MARS, to examine our baseline situation in both districts. Where we are now and where we will be in five years if we don't change our current model of operation, the so-called do-nothing scenario. Uh, Mars reported out its findings in October of 2020, <clears throat> and their report confirmed that, number one, we've had a dramatic decline in enrollment in both districts, and that decline is projected to continue. So between the years 2000 and 2030, that 30-year span, the projection is that we're going to have a 52% decline in enrollment across the two districts. The decline is actually a little bit higher in Southern Berkshire than it is in Berkshire Hills, but that's the projection across the two districts. Um, as the enrollment is declining, operational costs are going up. So notwithstanding declining enrollment, operational costs are going up. And as you know, the lion's share of each school district's budget is uh, personnel costs, salaries and benefits. So those operational costs rise every year and they're projected to continue to rise. State funding for our districts has been flat and is projected to continue to be flat. The needs of our students, however, are not flat. The needs of our students are increasing. Uh, in many areas, and particularly in the areas of social-emotional development, special ed, English language learners, and the increasing need and demand for career vocational technical education. So, declining enrollment, increasing operational costs, flat state re revenue, increasing needs of the students, and all of this together puts tremendous pressure on the districts and on our towns to be able to continue to maintain current offerings, much less make additional investments in the educational enhancements we need to uh, invest in in order to keep our students competitive. Our planning board's analysis of the MARS findings led our finance subcommittee to conclude in December of 2020 that our current model of operation is not sustainable. That was the conclusion of our finance subcommittee in December of 2020, which led us as a board to embark on our second phase of work to look at what alternative models might serve our kids and our communities better. In June of 2021, we engaged our current research team, which is led by our project manager, Jake Everline, who's with me tonight. Uh, Jake is a 30-year educator. He was a teacher. He was a college dean. He was the superintendent of the Pittsfield Public Schools. He was the superintendent of the Lee Public Schools. Uh, and he is a leading expert in regionalization and collaboration efforts across school districts. On his team are three other former superintendents and experts in career vocational and technical education, which we use the acronym CBTE to describe, uh, public school finance and communication. So we engaged Jake and his team in June of 2021. Nine months later, March 22, 2022, following nine months of study uh, and 15 separate research reports that focused on enrollment, indicators of educational quality, historical efforts at regionalization and collaboration, a facility study, and many other areas, the research team presented its findings to the planning board. 
The team looked at seven different possible alternative models that ranged over a wide spectrum from increased collaboration to full merger. And it made a recommendation on what it believed was the model that held out the most promise. And that preferred model, as we refer to it, was to merge the two school districts into a single pre-K through 12 district, maintaining all existing elementary and middle schools in place, but creating a new merge 9 through 12 high school to be built on the Great Barrington campus. So that's the preferred model that was recommended by our research team. In support of that recommendation, the research team identified both educational advantages and fiscal efficiencies that they believed would be achievable by combining the two districts. And if you look at your packet, uh, tab A, page three, those advantages are listed. And I put them into three buckets. The first bucket is a bucket for the students. What would the students get out of this proposed merger? They would get more. They would get more opportunities through additional courses, programs, electives, and enrichment experiences. There would be expanded programming for high school students in a new state-of-the-art facility, including up to eight Chapter 74 CBTE programs as well as all the other existing career pathways and early college opportunities currently being offered in both of the districts. They would get greater variety and support for sports and extracurricular activities. There would be a pooling of resources to address the growing need to support student social and emotional needs, special education, and English language learners. And they would get a larger, more diverse student body with more opportunities to forge new connections. For teachers, there would be more professional development. There would be deeper peer networking and support opportunities. And for town taxpayers, there would be realization of fiscal efficiencies through the alignment of administrative and operational functions and savings in the range of 1.5 to 2.1 million dollars annually that could be reinvested in educational enhancements that could be used to offset increases in town assessments or some combination of the two members of our eight town board then held three two-hour meetings which were facilitated by an outside facilitator to discuss each of the seven possible models that the research team had presented together with its preferred model. And on April 26, following those deliberations, the board voted by a vote of 16 to 6 to select as its preferred model the model that the research team had recommended, which again is a single district, single administration, maintaining existing elementary and middle schools where they are, and merging the high school on the Great Barrington campus in a new building that would include state-of-the-art CBTE space and programming. In taking that vote, the board recognized that there was much work that lay ahead, including more research of the selected model, particularly in the area of student transportation, additional testing of assumptions used in the model that demonstrated the savings, and additional community outreach. So that's the work that is now ongoing. We have also begun to lay the groundwork to begin the process of drafting a new eight-town regional school district agreement that could be put to the voters in the eight towns perhaps as early as next spring. It would be during that process of developing that agreement that we would begin to grapple with the difficult questions of committee composition for an eight-town district, that's a pretty big district, um, and assessment methodology, both for capital costs and operational costs. Currently, the two districts have different assessment methodologies. 
and the team is working on developing alternative methodologies for consideration by the eight towns. Recognizing that this isn't going to work if the methodology results in any immediate significant swings in relative assessments. So our plan is to put together an advisory group to help the board with the work of putting together a proposed regional school district agreement. And I'm hoping that we will be able to enlist into that group folks from each of the eight member towns. It's not going to be easy to put the right team together it's going to be a substantial time commitment. Uh, I'm hoping that once we get started, which I think will be later this month, we will be meeting every two weeks. There are going to be some tough issues to tackle uh, that will require forward thinking, creative minds interested in finding solutions, and who preferably have had some experience in working through these types of agreements. So I hope this board uh, we'll start thinking about who might fit that role uh, from Sheffield. And the plan is for me, as chair of the planning board, to appoint members of our advisory group informed by the recommendations of the town select boards and finance committees. Another priority for this phase of our work is additional community outreach. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Peter Taylor in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the funding uh, that we've had to date. Um, we received significant support from the state. Um, our initial grant was 50,000. We got a second grant from the state of 125,000. A third grant from the state of 130,000. We got 8,000, as you may recall, from each of our member towns for a total of an additional 64,000. We got another 6,000 from the two districts, and we got a $2,500 grant from Berkshire Tacana Community Foundation. We've also received tremendous support, financial support, from the Berkshire Educational Resources K-12 group, known as Burke, formerly known as the Berkshire County Educational Task Force, which has paid a significant portion of the compensation of our research team. So we've had support from them as well. Unfortunately, there was no regionalization money in the state budget this year, which was a real disappointment to us and something of a surprise. And the money we did get from the state had to be expended by June 30 of this year, and it has been. So we have no more state funds. Um, a word about the $300,000 plus that we have spent. That's a lot of money. Over $300,000 has been spent on this initiative so far. Um, we recognize it's a lot of money. It's been spent primarily on expert analysis and review uh, that has been necessary for, our, for us to look at the issues that are before us. All the board members are volunteers. None of the board members are getting paid. The size of the budget gives you, I hope, some sense, not only of the complexity of this work, but also the comprehensiveness of the study that we have conducted. Um, as I said, most of the money that we've spent so far has been from state grants and other funding sources. We have been able to preserve most of the town funds, uh, which we got last year. Um, and that money is going to take us through September. So we have enough money left, a little over $50,000, that will fund our group, our research group, our administrative support um, through September, so through September 30. We are exploring other possible funding options to get us to next May. Um, but I did want to flag for this board that there is a possibility that we may need to come back to the towns in the fall for some additional funding to get us to May. Assuming, of course, that the additional work that we do as a planning board leads us to a recommendation that we want to present to the voters in May. Um, so that's sort of where we are. Um, 
I, I would like to have Peter Taylor talk to you a little bit about the community outreach that we've done so far, which has been significant, and what we have planned for the future. Uh, Jane Everline he is here to answer all of the questions you may have about uh, the research recommendation and the data that was analyzed that brought the team to that conclusion. Um, in your packet, I have reproduced um, the frequently asked questions that we have received both during meetings and through our website and through our community forums and they're in these nine categories and so you can peruse that at your at your leisure but I think those questions are really interesting to read and I hope the responses will be uh, informative and uh, will help you think about the issues that we've been thinking about for about two and a half years. Um, Lucy, before Peter speaks, um, I'm not sure that I'm going to entertain questions tonight. Okay. Um, primarily because there's four members of the public here, and I think this board um, uh, needs to discuss how we hear the concerns of our, our residents rather than just the four people who have shown up or I believe the 50-some that were on the last uh, two presentations last week. So I'd like to not give the false expectations that if someone has come with a list of questions that they're going to be answered tonight. Um, right. We'll talk about how to, uh, to um, handle that matter in um, maybe after this presentation, because I'm very concerned that people have the chance to be heard, have the chance to get their uh, questions answered, and that this is not being done with false information and or on social media. So I, I think there may be a, a reset that's necessary so everyone feels involved. So, Peter? I will, of course, allow board questions. I should set that straight. Thank you all. I want to join with uh, Lucy with my appreciation of you putting this on the agenda and for the colleagues on the planning board that are here today. Um, my charge tonight is to talk a little bit about the outreach process that we have uh, through the planning board. Um, from our first meeting and the work that has followed, a principal priority and value of the planning board has been outreach. Um, as you all know, as uh, members of the select board, uh, probably the most important thing we do as communities is the education of our kids. And when you think about the educational process, there are um, many stakeholders that are part of the success of that endeavor. Obviously, the children that we educate, the parents, dedicated educators and staff, um, and also elected officials that place it a priority in the, in the budget process. Um, and the results are clear in both districts in terms of the tradition of educational excellence because of those stakeholders working together. And so we re recognized early on that we needed to, to engage uh, those constituencies in this process. Um, as Lucy said, we, were, uh, we had our first meeting, I believe, in February of 2020. And what happened in March of 2020? Uh, we immediately uh, shut into our homes. and. Uh, and so the type of in-person outreach that we always envisioned uh, at the start of this process was not able to be fulfilled until recently, such as tonight when we're able to be together. Um, but in spite of the challenges of the pandemic, we've done a number of important things to engage those constituencies. Uh, we've undertaken a survey. Uh, we have done a series of focus groups. Um, uh, we have encouraged participation in our planning board meetings. Uh, most notably, as Lucy said, we had three meetings in, uh, at which we looked at three models, uh, discussed them as a planning board, and we um, played, we, we made a particular, uh, we played a particular focus on, on reaching out through our channels to get people to participate. Um, also last week, we held two virtual uh, community engagement sessions. Um, and we had over 100 people participate. Um, all of these outreach activities have been coordinated by an outreach committee uh, that I've been a part of, but I also want to tip my hat uh, 
to Nadine and to Bonnie because of their hard work and thinking about how best we can do that outreach in, in, in the time of COVID. Um, so what have we learned uh, through the, that outreach process? Um, you know, first of all, I'm going to divide it into two categories. Those um, elements or those aspirations for what we can achieve by working together and also the concerns. So what can we achieve by working together? First, I think we've heard uh, in a number of occasions how through a, a merger, a partnership, we can offer more curricular, extracurricular, and co-curricular activities. Uh, that is of interest to students um, and to parents to have those types of, of educational opportunities and the experiences that come with them. Uh, we've also heard an interest in, in having uh, more diverse classes uh, more diverse experiences. Um, we've heard a lot, um, not just from students uh, and those that educate them, but also from the community in terms of the importance of career vocational education, <coughs> CBTE, as you see uh, described, in terms of how as uh, uh, the eight towns can, can really bring uh, career education uh, to a larger scale. Uh, that is in demand from students who might not necessarily see a path immediately go to go on to a four-year degree, but also from employers that are uh, interested in partnering with educators to create the types of experiences in high school that would allow them to transition directly into the workforce. Um, so those are some of the things that we've heard that are benefits. So what are some of the concerns that we've heard? Um, obviously, uh, one of the concerns we have as we are in Southern Berkshire is potentially larger class sizes, given uh, the opportunities that students now have uh, in Southern Berkshire for smaller classes. Um, we also have heard concerns around transportation. Uh, understandably, we've, we've heard some concern about dislocation. How might this affect uh, teachers and staff as the districts come together? Uh, and, and so those are some of the concerns that we've heard. Um, We've also heard, and we're going to act on this more, how can we lift up student voice during this process? How can we hear directly from young people in terms of what their aspirations are uh, for the eight towns and particularly for their district now? Uh, we've had the opportunity to, to, to hear once from a forum that was organized by student leaders um, from um, Everett and from Monument, and we are hopeful to have another um, in the coming months because of the importance of, of student voice. Um, we also plan, as Lucy has said, to, to engage others, both in the regional engagement, regional agreement drafting process to get some important content expertise and skills uh, from the local communities, but also in the educational visioning process. And so we intend to continue with that, uh, that high priority we've placed on it and that value of community engagement. Um, so with that, um, you are not uh, entertaining questions if I heard, and so Maybe I'll offer Jake as... Well, no, I'm going to... Um, I, I would like to see if the board members have any oh, questions. Right. What I was trying to say is that I think there's questions from more people than are the four people who are represented here tonight that are not board members, and I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to um, add to the interests, uh, the plus side, and also add to the concerns, because I myself have heard a lot of different concerns that weren't uh, summarized uh, in those. So let me just ask if the if the board members have any questions of, of anyone. Well, I don't because I've been living it for two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes two and three meetings a week. So let me shift that because I think you've just brought up a very good point. Do you have anything that you would like to, as, as a member, and one of Sheffield's delegates add to the conversation. Well, I would really like to encourage the community people who have questions to please reach out to the planning board. We have um, a link on our website that allows people to submit their questions, which is where the uh, fact the FAQs have come from. They've been submitted by board members, but they've also been submitted by the community member members. And I strongly encourage anyone with questions or concerns to please get them to us because we can't address them if we don't know what they are. 
you know, uh, Renee says she's heard some concerns. Well, have they been forwarded to the planning board so that we can address them? You don't know. So let's make sure that these questions and concerns do get directed to the planning board because we can't solve the problem if we don't know what the problems are. So, Bonnie, you're one of our other, we have two thirds of our delegation here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you wish to make s some short comments or anything uh, to add to this conversation? Um, I you have to come to the mic if, you're, if you want to. If you don't want to, then you can just stay seated. Okay. Never let it be said. <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie Silver's 15 Bow Wow Road. Um, I would just like to express my biggest concern that given all that I've heard over the two, eight, two and a half years and all of the work, there are still so many questions to be answered. And I hope that the lack of funds will not keep us from what I think you mentioned the clarity. I don't want to be driven by a May warrant if we have conflicting information out there, if we do not have a community that's aware of everything that's going on. And I would encourage, as Nadine said, let people uh, examine with us, and hopefully the select board can examine with us how we make the citizens of Sheffield more aware and to hear, because I get a lot of concerns. So I think that part, the outreach to the community is going to be critical, and the other part is not being driven by May 23rd. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, how about you? Any questions? Um, a few questions, a sure. lot of concerns. Um, Have you sent your concerns in? I have not. I've only. <laughs> and I, I, I share that. I, I, I share do that not like. Okay. I commented at one of the Zoom meetings where it was more interactive early on. Then you went to a platform that didn't really allow any input. And then you went to this new platform that allows input, but it looked pretty hard to navigate. I wasn't on the meeting. I did watch the uh, video of it. Um, and it didn't look like it went all that great from what I could see from the video. So there was people on iPads that couldn't see the questions. And I dropped off because I couldn't navigate it. I got so frustrated. <laughs> so, and okay, so I share your concern. Okay. But how about your questions and concerns? Uh, the questions and concerns. Um, I know this is the preferred model that was voted on. If I were to make my own decision based on my own assumptions, this would be my least preferred model. It hampers savings by not having all the children in a singular school district and a singular campus where you can size each classroom accordingly. By keeping all the elementary schools open and separate, you lose that effect, you lose that cost savings. Um, Transportation will become more of an issue by keeping all the elementaries. I know that it's a sensitive issue, and I'm sure that's probably what guided your choice to stay away from closing all the online schools. But from my point of view, that was the biggest financial opportunity missed. The other thing is it would make our repurposing of our high school almost impossible. Uh, we would, you know, we already seen what happened in Great Barrington with their old elementary school, which has sat there forever. Housatonic's elementary school is sitting, and they're a singular campus. Ours is attached. Our elementary school is part of our high school, is one building. To repurpose that building for something else while you're running an elementary school and half of it is gonna be nearly impossible. So we take a perfectly good high school and we turn it into a liability. That's another one of my major concerns. Of course, transportation with keeping all the elementary schools open, plus trucking kids all the way from down here, which I'm, you know, my farm sits on the Connecticut state line. So we're pretty good shot from the other side of Great Barrington. Um, so I, you know, I could go on, but I don't 
wanna wanna beat on things too much here at this point. I do have a lot of major concerns going forward that could put Sheffield in a very untenable situation. And some of the things that you speak of that are cost saving, like larger class size, could be achieved right in our own school district if we wanted to. We have kept our class size is relatively small and I do believe that was a reason and a purpose and a direction not because we couldn't increase class size um, and to save two million dollars that is a lot of six-figure positions that would have to go away to make that kind of a cost savings especially with this model and you also then have the elementary schools without administration in them I would assume if you're going to dense administration costs that far, it's going to be hard to administer all these outlying small schools. I, I just have a hard time taking the assumptions that were presented and making them work in a realistic manner. So you're not necessarily against it, and you just need to have some of your concerns addressed. If possible. Yeah, yes. okay. Can, can you right. jot those down and... and, and I jotted and, some of them down. I, but I, 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 I mean, I would really love to be able to submit them or to the, mm -hmm. to the um, project management team mm -hmm. so they can do some work on, on it because I think that your questions are the same kind of questions that are rolling around in somebody else's head and they haven't formulated those questions. And these are the kinds of questions that our committee needs to hear. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to just ask our select board to think about uh, the possibility because I myself would like to find a way to vote for this. I, I have questions and I haven't seen everything come out the way that I need information and I usually need information to vote. Um, uh, so I would like to have our board give thought and we can discuss this at a, at a next meeting or a next working session to facilitating for our residents a, um, I'm just going to call it a listening session because that's what everybody calls them, um, but some intake where we can have people, invite people to come forward and share concerns exactly as Bob did. I don't want to get into the emotionalism. I don't want to get into what my grandmother did or anything like that, though I know that's very important to people. I'd like to get concrete concerns that the committee can deal with. And I would also like to get advantages that would go beyond what has have been presented. And I think if we were to hold that forum for our Sheffield residents where they just come and talk, we will scribe. It saves people having to find the email address, having to get it to the right person. We will have a collection of those because I'm, I've heard even remarks that I'm not sure that they, I'm not sure what they do with them. And I think that's very, a very bad remark, but I've heard it. So I would like us to think about that. I'd like to move this process along. I know every objection if we do not have it addressed in some satisfactory way, you can't address everything, we'll come up at town meeting and I would rather get them out in the open and hear from people because I know people care deeply about this. So I'd like for our board to, to um, consider that. Lucy, I also am very concerned about the time frame of May. Um, uh, I know we have talked uh, uh, about this, but. I don't know, um, I remember, and I think Nadine, you were there when we did our last change to the regional school agreement. We did the evaluation formula for how money, how costs were distributed. I, I, I don't know if there's a specific mandatory way that one has to do that. I want to make sure if there is by state law that we do it that way so that we don't have it thrown out. And I'd like to know who besides maybe an advisory board, I'd like to know what the composition of that's going to be. I'll send that question in um, because I think people are very, um, I think some people are concerned that this has significant town input. Last time around the five towns, we had a member of the select board and we had a member of the finance committee. Uh, we didn't have any school committee members, but uh, I think it was run by the school committee because it was the school committee uh, agreement. So I just want to make sure that we're kosher on that. 
Uh, now, if anybody brought some questions tonight, um, if you have them in writing, I know that Lucy will take them. Uh, and uh, if not, we're also going to place copies of this in the Senior Center, in uh, at the town clerk's office, in the library, and um, where have we missed? The usual. Selectman's office. And the Selectman's office, okay. And <coughs> Lucy, do you have electronic of this? Yeah, I can put it together. Could, could, you, yeah. could you send it to Rhonda? We can also post it on our website. I'd, I'd really like to have people have as much um, exposure to this as possible, okay? This is also on your website, correct? Yes. I read um, most of this yeah. off the website. Oh, then we can, I like to make things as easy as possible. <laughs> I agree. People know people. to come to our website. Right. Um, just Everybody's so busy. One more. Thing to find if you don't find it immediately, it can discourage someone from looking at it. Um, Lucy, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to respond if I could and ask Jake to, to help me out on this uh, to the question of timing because I do think it's a critical one uh, and something we haven't really talked about in depth tonight. So, we have a challenge in front of us, but we also have a tremendous opportunity. And the challenge and the opportunity are that uh, there is a likelihood that a new high school is going to be built in Great Barrington. It hasn't been built yet. If we are going to merge with Berkshire Hills, this is the time to do it. Because if we want to have a merged high school, then we want to be on the ground floor and planning that high school. We want to have a voice in what that high school looks like. We want to be part of the envisioning of what that high school is going to look like, what it's going to do, how it's going to serve our students. So if we want to merge, we have to do that. We have to make that decision in time for us to be able to participate in that envisioning process, in that planning process, so that we can have a seat at the table as that development work, as that design work, as that envisioning work is being done. And that's why we have this pressure, uh, Madam Chair, of, of, of needed, needing to move forward. If the decision is no, we don't want to merge, we want to stay separate and take our chances with declining enrollment and try and manage all these challenges on our own, fine, if that's our decision. But if our decision is to merge, this is the time to do it. This is the time to make that decision. And we have been looking at this for two and a half years. I understand there's still questions out there. I think some of the questions actually have been addressed in our frequently asked questions. There's some questions that haven't been, but we certainly can get all those questions addressed. But we do have this timing challenge and this timing opportunity. And it would be a terrible thing if at the end of the day we decided we did want to merge and we didn't get in on the ground floor and that high school wasn't built and sized to accommodate our kids. That would be a terrible result. And that's sort of what we're up against as a planning board right now in terms of timing. Um, Jake, can you talk a little bit about the, the MSBA process and sure. the timing there and how that all works? Of course. Yes. Thank you. Right. So um, there are two parallel processes that are happening right now. One is the regionalization work, which the Regional School District um, Planning Board is authorized to do. That regionalization work can go on in perpetuity. Um, in fact, there's, if you look at the historical literature that we put together, you'll see there's a cycle of this sort of work happening going back decades, right? Um, the second process that's happening right now is the Mass School Building Authority process. And I'm, I'm, you're probably somewhat familiar with that, but when a district wants to do a project, you all have had projects with the MSB, you apply, you write a statement of interest, and then the um, MSBA board reviews those and accepts them or rejects them. So Berkshire Hills Regional School District has been attempting to get a high school project since actually 2008 
when they started. It's, it's that long a haul. And as you all know, um, they were successful in getting a statement of interest approved um, in the around uh, 2012, um, which ultimately got rejected by their voters twice. Um, and so as a result, they actually lost their line, um, their place in line with the Massacre Building Authority. Since that rejection, they have been, they filed six statements of interest. You can file once a year. Um, they were recently accepted in um, March of this year um, back into the pipeline. So they are in an eligibility phase. And that um, phase is, um, begins on August 1. And they have 270 days to move through eligibility. So in those 270 days, um, they have to do a variety of things from sort of pre-feasibility scoping, enrollment scoping, some early ed visioning planning. Um, and all those things will move them into the next step, which then have to be reviewed and approved by the MSBA. There's a lot of work for them still to do. And I would be lying to you if I told, told you all it's a done deal. I think they have a really strong case, and they made a strong case to the MSBA, obviously, to be received. Um, so my argument from very early, I think, runs um, very parallel to what Lucy just said to you all, and that is that the idea of doing this together and building an envisioning process together and having a shared ownership in it, I think, is critical to an eight-town effort in creating something that you all mutually owned and mutually um, really are proud of. So um, the other piece too, obviously, is just very pragmatically, you've got to know if you're building a high school for 500 or 700 kids. It's really that simple. The MSBA um, you know, creates square footage models based on the number of kids who are there. And they, do it. they don't do it on spec. Um, I, was, I wrote the statement of interest for Taconic High School. Um, so I know the process. I was on the, the Wakona School Building um, committee, so I know the process there, and we made an argument at Pitfield that we were going to get more choice kids and more vote kids, and they said, we will not drive enrollment based on what you think you're going to get. It's what you have confirmed. And so that's why I think there is a level of, there, there's a timetable here in the next, you know, about a year uh, to move this through. Does that help? Yeah, I think some of the concerns are that, and again, we're being very honest, I hope, in this conversation that Berkshire Hills is driving this process mm -hmm. and that the new high school is what's brought this all to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, that the 6% uh, per six, six bonus if there's three more schools involved. Right. And I, you know, I'm, I'm stating those as things I have heard. Uh, tremendous concerns on that. Whether they're right or wrong, I don't know the answer to that and I'm not going to speculate. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to be important for this planning uh, committee, uh, planning board, to show that the rush to May, uh, if that's when things are ready, is not just to conform to this. I have not, nor do I have any interest in talking to the Mass School Board Authority. Um, I've understood this is the first attempt or in the state to combine two regional school districts. Mm -hmm. I hope that DESE and our representatives and the Mass School Building Authority would take something into account given the timing of what is a very complicated process. Um, Great Barrington's gonna, that school district's gonna build that high school or at least give it to the voters whether they approve it or not. I'm just, I'm just expressing concerns that have been extremely damaging about the influence of this drive to build the new high school uh, and the role of um, the role that Southern uh, that uh, Berkshire Hills may play I mean it's no secret I'm not I'm not letting any I'm not saying anything that people have not heard before so I just caution so I think we need to see a very specific time table as to how we don't so rush, but how, if it's possible to get things accomplished by May town vote, 
we can do that. Um, 270 days is about nine months from August 1st. So there is a little bit of flex in that, okay? But I, I feel strongly that if voters don't have enough information to vote on, they will vote no. And that to me would be more of a tragedy to potentially have a good regionalization plan go down in, in, in voting. So I, I've always found Sheffield voters vote well. They need to have the information to know what they're doing, especially when their kids and money is involved. So I'm just, I don't know if Bob or Nadine want to add anything. No, I've added enough for tonight. I'll okay, do well, the I think answers. this has been extremely productive. Um, and I really want to thank uh, uh, Lucy and Jake and, and Peter, as well as Bonnie, Kathy, Eileen, and, and Frank for coming. Um, I, I would like to see if there's some way that we can, as a board, facilitate. Uh, let's get this stuff out. Let's, let's not hear it at town meeting. It, it does no good. This, this group and this group and this board is working so hard. And for them to be playing with half a deck because the public is, it doesn't want to comment, it's not fair to them. It's just not fair at all. We are doing a presentation at the Senior Center on the 12th at 6.30. Um, it's not just for seniors. Anyone in Sheffield who has any interest in hearing about what the work has done is more than welcome to attend. Uh, please bring your questions. Please bring your concerns. Um, we would like you to call the senior center to uh, sign up so we have an idea of head counts. So we have enough chairs set up. So the phone number there is 413-229-7037. Uh, um, and then we're going to do that again at 630 on the 12th. So you Excellent. can do something as a we can do something as a board after that if you Absolutely. wish. Let's see yeah. what kind of turnout we get on the 12th. Yeah. And then y'all can come up with ideas yeah. as to how to get the people to come out and talk to us because we've been begging yeah. them begging just, them to come and talk to us. That, that the one meeting that we had some money on the table, it was it was a contentious issue. We had five hundred and nine people come out to vote. Okay. But that was an actual town meeting. Well, this will be an actual town meeting when people vote. I understand okay? that. And I, I heard that there were 100 people that were on the meeting on Tuesday and Thursday. But I, I really wonder how many true citizens were there once the, the planning board were taken off, the staff was taken off, the consultants were taken off, and anybody who was associated. Uh, 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 so we're not reaching even a percentage of the voters who might come out. And again, I'm concerned of last minute comments that nuke the whole thing. So we'll go forward and we'll discuss that again. Please attend the Senior Center briefing if you can and questions. And we'll get this put up on our website. We'll get the link uh, put up that you can just type your, click on and type your questions and send them straight to um, the, uh, regional, uh, the regional school district planning board. We'll try to make it as easy as possible for you to give feedback. Um, I don't know that there's much more that we can do than that. I think we're good. All right. All right. Thank you again very much. And we will, we will get all of these out to the respective places. So um, let's continue with our agenda. We have uh, some more uh, appointments um, to make for um, the current fiscal year. Um, and Rhonda, would you like to read these for us? Sure. So these were announced at the June 21st meeting, so they're ready for appointment if the board is ready to do that. Agricultural Commission is, there's three vacancies, three-year terms. We have James Kelly. Ashley Falls Historic District Commission is a three-year term, one vacancy. Sandra Preston. The BRPC delegate is a one-year, one vacancy. Siri Hoyt was nominated by the planning board. Sanitation inspector, one year, one vacancy, Scott Smith. Well, I make a motion that we approve those appointments as read. I'll second that. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Our next item is um, appointment announcements, and uh, these will be made at our next meeting unless there's some sort of, uh, oh, these are the vacancies. No, there's, there's appointments on There's there. appointments and vacancies. 
Would you like me to read them? Um, Oh, yes. Okay. There's a lot of the first ones have nobody listed with them. Okay. Rhonda, would you read these for us, please? So these are the ones who are, we are announcing tonight for action at our next meeting. Commission on Disabilities, one vacancy, Gail Mullen. Cultural Council, three vacancies. We have two people, Joseph Colosje and Sally Haver. Fire Chief, one vacancy, one year, David Ulrich. Historical Commission, three vacancies, Kathy Orlando. And the Zoning Board of Appeals, one vacancy, Eric Carlson. Okay, we'll make uh, these appointments at the next meeting. Uh, what threw me off is there's a lot of um, other commissions who are seeking members. Would you read those for us, Rhonda? Agricultural Commission, Agricultural Commission Alternate, Ashley Falls Historic District Commission, Board of Assessors, Conservation Commission Alternate, Council on Aging. We still need another count, cultural council. Electrical inspector assistant. Uh, five town cable advisory. The historical commission will still have two vacancies. Housing commission will have one. Housing commission alternate. Public wear. Southern Berkshire District veteran service delegate and the ZBA alternate are all still open. Thank you. Um, we haven't heard back from any of our public wares. We haven't had a public wear in here. <laughs> oh, we haven't had, um, is it the scale inspectors or the constables that we always have, the group of four that do? There's a group of people that always apply for that. Oh, so what happens with no public wares? Somebody else does it? I have no idea, Renee. We haven't had anybody oh. apply in probably 10 years. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem like it's really a needed commission. I was just going to say that. Thank you, Nadine. I'm sorry to be so that. cold on that one. Uh, all right. The next item is discussion possible action regarding the flag policy. We have this in front of us. Um, just to very quickly recap, this came out of a U.S. Supreme Court decision regarding the fact that Boston was letting basically any organization fly flags on two of their flag posts when they went to deny an organization. They sued it up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that since there was no policy and there was a practice in place, um, the city of Boston lost. So we had received a notice from our um, council that it would be wise to put a flag policy um, in place. So. Um, we discussed this earlier, uh, that there would be uh, flags that could be authorized, <coughs> obviously uh, the flag of the United States of America, the Commonwealth flag, the town of Sheffield, um, official flags of various military services in the, in the U.S., and also the official MIA POW flag. What, what would the board like to do? I'll make a motion that we accept the policy as presented. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Our next uh, item is um, further discussion regarding the use of opioid funding. And um, was did we have someone doing a letter on that, Rhonda? No, this was to announce to the public that you have discussed uses for the opioid funds. There's been requests or meetings to talk about pooling resources, but as a board, you decided that you were going to hold off on any spending until you were sure that Sheffield's needs were met first and that you would discuss how to use the remaining funds after we've gotten all of the needs from the chief of police, the fire chief, or any other organization that provides emergency services, and then you would talk about the possibility of funding different organizations or pooling with some of the other towns. They're very preliminary in discussion and how to do that. Um, so this was just to announce where you were as a board after that last. Great, thank you. And I think at a previous discussion, the board decided that these funds would receive a special account 
uh, and that uh, uh, the board and uh, in conjunction with our town administrator would um, take control of these funds. Yes. So I, I think it's appropriate to thank Martin Mitzoff for the work that he's done on this. And I believe when he went to leave the board, he said that he would like to be involved, but I'm not sure that that involvement is needed any longer given what the board had discussed. So maybe we could send him a letter of appreciation for his work on this. He's the one who got this started and has kind of dogged mm -hmm. it for at least two plus years. <coughs> could I have a motion on that? Or I guess I just made a so motion. Moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next item is on um, discussion possible action regarding the proposal for town hall spacing needs. Rhonda? So there was a possibility that maybe we'd be able to receive grant funding from the, I think it's USDA Rural Development. Or so one stop. Or one stop to maybe create some more space in town hall, especially the third floor. It's kind of just full of storage and boxes and things that need to be cleaned out. And so in order to identify those needs, we would like to use EDM, who's proposed for $5,900, to come in and take a look at Town Hall and assess our spaces and what could be if we were able to get the funding to do some further renovations in Town Hall. I will say that this type of initial work is almost totally mandatory <laughs> to go ask for some money. Um, so Maybe even before the engineering, they kind of want to know what your plans are, what you're looking at. And if it can even be done, maybe we will figure out that it can. You know, I don't know. Now, Rhonda, is this going to be open to more than just the third floor? In other words, are... Oh, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Even is... if it's redesigned, uh, Okay, good, good, floor. good, excellent. Whatever works for using the spacing in the most appropriate and efficient way. All right, what would the board like to do? So I'm assuming you need a motion to um, contract with EDM? Yes. yes. So I'll make a motion that we contract with EDM for the, <coughs> excuse me, town hall programming space assessments needs uh, with a fixed amount of $5,900. Um, with uh, Rhonda having the authority to sign. Mm -hmm. And I'll second that. Any further discussion? Um, we have this money. We know where we're going to appropriate it from. Yes, I will take it, I believe, from the um, Buildings and Grounds article. Okay, perfect. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Next item is discussion possible action regarding October 9th bicycle tour. Uh, we have the um, request in front of us, but Rhonda, can you just um, summarize it for us? Sure. So it's unique. They're calling it the inaugural edition of a unique bicycle tour, the Lime Rock Epic. The event will be held on Sunday, October 9th. They're looking for the board's support to have this race. There's no road closures, no intersection controls. They will expect that all participant, participants will operate within the normal bicycle laws of Massachusetts and Connecticut. They're offering a choice of three distances, 68 miles, 48 miles, 18 miles. All will start and finish at Lime Rock Park in Salisbury. So all the routes are kind of laid out. I think you can go on and click the links um, if you want to see what the link, you know, what routes they are. So they're not asking us for anything other than support of the race that will go through some parts of Sheffield. We've done this in the past for mm -hmm. other bike mm -hmm. events, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're just asking for our, our approval. So I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, bike race coming through Sheffield on October 9th called the Lime Rock Epic. Second. Uh, Rhonda, I didn't click on any of these links. Uh, will we have any road paving going on? Or are there any of these roads that they want to go on that are not suitable? I wouldn't determine what's suitable and what's not for a bicycle. Yeah. I'm assuming that they, they have, have looked at yeah. them. Okay. I will check to see the one road that we know right now that's going to be paved will be county. And I'm not sure they're going to go up that far, but I can look. Okay, that would be my only concern is that they're not on a road that's that's subject to, you know, repair. Other than that, um, uh, 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm surprised actually we haven't had more uh, requests for either a bike or a runner races. I think they just do it and don't tell us. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, well, they, really, they, they really don't have to notify They don't. Us. It's, it's nice of them to tell us. Yeah. And a notification. Yes. And yes. it does spread the word a little bit yes. too. So drum up a little interest. Um, we do have um, discussion possible action regarding a one day alcohol permit. And um, Rhonda, I'm going to assume that they have everything in that they need. They do not. So I'm hoping that if you approve this, you will do a pending receipt of their liquor liability insurance. So moved. So this is a one day liquor license um, for the Christ Trinity Church on July 17th, 2022, from noon to 4 p.m. on the lawns of the church. Um, Bob has moved it. I'll second it, subject to the liquor. You know, uh, I've gone by this sign a few times. I don't have a calendar with me, but I'm just wondering if Saturday and the 17th go together. It's the 16th. I have seen the 16th. It's the on 16th. The signs. Yep. Could we correct that for them? Good catch, Renee. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've just seen it for that. You know, I mean, <laughs> Good catch. <Yeah. laughs> the other question that goes along with this is whether you will waive the fee of fifty-nine dollars for the one-day alcohol. Do we waive it for any other nonprofits? We haven't so far. We do waive it for Dewey Hall. Do we waive it for any other nonprofits? Like if the church does something or? I think that uh, this might be the first time that we've had a church apply to sell it themselves rather than the big elm coming in and, and, and doing, doing the vendor. Sell. So it's, it's a little different. So would we charge the big elm if they were going to oh, do yeah. one day event? Absolutely we would, but they're not nonprofit, even though they may be helping a fundraiser. So board, what do you want to do? So is Big Y selling this, uh, big, sorry, Big Elm selling this or is the church getting the beer at a discount and selling it? I can't answer, but I can tell you the church is the one who's doing the selling. Okay. So I think for me that makes a little bit of a difference. I'm guessing that some of the profits is going to be going to the church. I would assume so. Um, I kind of wish I had that information. Yeah, I kind of concur with that. Well, I'm also a little concerned about waiving fees. I didn't realize we waived fees for Dewey. One, one nonprofit leads to 100 nonprofits. Well, I'm kind of wondering, this is a one-time thing. It involves $59. I wonder, to be consistent, we should waive, and then we should look at and possibly, I don't hate to use the word develop a policy, but develop a stand on, I mean, all nonprofits should be treated equally. equally. Yes. Okay. And that would be something that we don't have a line of them asking us for it. So I think we should waive it for uh, Christ uh, Trinity Church. And my husband goes there. I'm not a, I'm a member. I'm an activities only. But... Uh, I think we should waive it. So there's fairness. no conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I'll probably be there hopefully just selling decent. something just or decent. make something for the event. But uh, I'm just looking at the fairness. I, but I think we should look at it because I think the last time we did liquor licenses for Dewey Hall, I think we did three or four different dates. They usually come in on it. Yeah, they usually come in. Each time they come in, they come in with three or four. And we don't charge them for any of them. Okay, then I, I would be okay with waiving. So would you reamend your or make another yes, motion? Yes, I will make a motion that we <laughs> approve the one day liquor license and waive the fifty nine dollar uh, charge. Pending the on getting depending the on the liquor insurance. Yes. Second. Is that good, Rhonda? We're good. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all right, board member items. Bob, let's start with you. I'm good. Nadine. Uh, let's see. I just wanted to mention the um, presentation at the Senior Center, and I have done that. And I also want to mention that there are many board and committee openings. Your town does not run by elected officials alone. So please, come to the plate. Join the team. 
<laughs> and is that it? That's it. I have no items. Rhonda? I just have one that I recently attended the Senior Center Volunteer Appreciation Dinner, and I just have to say what a lovely event it was. The food was delicious. Um, everybody was so friendly and seemed to have a great time. Lori and Kathy provided games that had everybody laughing and participating, so it was wonderful, and it's also wonderful to see so many volunteers who do so many things for the Senior Center. Yeah, there was a room full. There's a room full. Wonderful. Yeah. And Sorry, was, I missed it. I had a conflict that day, so yeah, unfortunate. It, it, and we didn't have everyone there, and it was very well attended, and the girls did a great job with it, for sure. Anything else, Rhonda? All right, public comment. Bonnie Silver is still 15 by a <laughs> um, Just to let you know, with Christchurch, the email I received is that it's really a community get together. Any money they make, they already designated to whom it's being contributed. So it's not for the church, it's for a charitable donation that they're doing. But I want to thank you for your statements in connection with listening to everything the regional planning board. Renee, I have to say, um, your statement about the fear of Berkshire Hills driving this show, you expressed a concern that's been brought up throughout our communities, and I'm glad you brought it to the forefront from a select board um, position. And the other thing, Bob, in response to what you said, in the original report when they spoke about um, repurposing Mount Everett, I brought it to their attention that these are attached buildings with attached um, systems but more importantly, a good part of Mount Everett is used for the secondary school. Because as education changed and as our little kids program has grown so enormously, we use more and more of Mount Everett for middle school and for the more advanced classes. They can use some of the high school labs, etc. So it is not an easily repurposed location so thank you for also raising that concern that's it thank you thank you anyone else all right is there a motion to adjourn so moved say it all in favor aye, aye. thank you this meeting is adjourned. <clears throat>